And it's just, to me, it's, it's not only that, not only that this island gives birth to just big people and big, big thinkers, but it becomes a crossroad of a lot of smart people crossing through here. And, you know, I'm always real proud of that. Don't, don't like overlook us just because we're from a small place. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast. And today we've got two great interviews for you. First is a very unique interview with John Nucci, Deputy Director of the Honolulu Department of Transportation Services, where I recorded this interview with him on the bus, at the bus stop. We're talking about the history of public transportation in Hawaii and a few other things like pineapples in Hawaii. And then we have a great in-depth leadership interview with former Navy Command Master Chief Keith Flip Griffin. I think you'll find this fascinating, a great conversation, especially geared toward mid-level managers in government and public transportation. All that on this episode of Transit Unplugged. During my recent trip to Honolulu, Hawaii, for the American Public Transportation Association's Business Members Conference, and to film an episode of our Transit Unplugged TV show, I got to spend quite a bit of time with John Nucci, a new friend who is Deputy Director of the Honolulu Department of Transportation Services on the island of Oahu. John is a native of Hawaii, and he spent some time with me, and we did something that I've never really done before on the podcast. Six years in, most of our interviews have either been sitting down in someone's office or online, but we did this one on the road. And I think you'll find this a fascinating interview, kind of in the style of, uh, you know, NPR radio interviews. So the first part of our discussion takes place while we're actually on the bus. It's an electric bus on route number eight. I think you'll really enjoy learning a little bit about the voice on the bus for the Oahu Transit Systems bus service. Aloha. Welcome aboard Route 8, Waikiki Beach and Hotel. John. You're one of our voices on the bus. We're on one of your electric buses, uh, route number eight. Um, that voice on the bus that, that is kind of saying the announcing the stops, I notice it's not only in English, but is it also in Hawaiian? Yeah, the voice on the bus, actually. Um, we went through a great effort to make sure that all the Hawaiian words were pronounced correctly on this, that they're consistent, that they're well-formed, that they sound correct. And um, tell us a little about the Hawaiian language itself. I mean... It kind of, was it, was it kind of going away for a while? Yeah, the Hawaiian language, unfortunately, you know, with all the, the, the powers of uh, influence of colonialism and westernization, really was on the verge of dying. The bus is departing. Really was on the verge of dying in the 70s, but for some people who just thought that they could not let this language die. And I am the benefactor of all the efforts that went into revitalizing and um, just reestablishing the place for Hawaiian language in our state and there are only two official languages in Hawaii. One is English, the other one is Hawaiian. Everybody knows English, not a lot of people know Hawaiian. And you know why that's important? You see the world, you see this Hawaiian place, you see these islands through a whole different lens when you understand why the place names are what they are. You understand the stories, you understand the myths and the legends and you can really get a good sense of of just this whole land that surrounds us. That's interesting. So um, does every place have its own Hawaiian name? Is that kind of how it works? Yeah, so we have a very strong system of naming places. Hawaiians named large land units. Those are called moku. Um, They had sustainable units from the valley to the ocean, um, top of the valley to the bottom of the ocean. Those are called ahupua'a. And there are smaller land sections called ili. And each of those had a name that was reminiscent that evoked the nature of that place. Hawaiians also named winds and rains, such that if I told you the, the names of the winds and the rains and the characteristics of those, you would know exactly where I was from. That's interesting. Now, the guy who's voicing this here, like some transit systems have somebody famous, an actor, whatever. Who did you get to do your voiceovers? A lot of times, it's funny aside here, people always ask us who does this voice. Um, it's become kind of a local thing and not just a local thing on Twitter it blew up one time where people were asking who does this voice because he needs to do CTA's voice (laughs) and people always ask us is this a computer doing it we could never do text to speech because of our attention to detail it needs to be perfect it needs to be pronounced correctly so believe it or not 
the voice that you hear right now is not of a native Hawaiian. He is a, a he comes to us via San Francisco and and Minneapolis, and he came here in the 70s. And during that Hawaiian language renaissance, learned from the best teachers, learned the art of hula, and just got a doctorate and became one of the preeminent scholars of Hawaiian language. That's amazing. And you were telling me that it kind of came up quick when you were uh, getting him recorded and he had to do a lot of work. Yeah, we recorded about uh, 5,000 and I think it eventually ended up being about 8,000 phrases to fill out our whole dictionary here. And he took a lot of extra effort to make sure everything was said explicitly correctly. Exactly. And you know, there's many different ways to pronounce certain Hawaiian words. So when we weren't sure how it was pronounced, we would have to go and research. Like, what are the place names of this area? And so we would sometimes record too, just in case we got it wrong. But then we go research and we keep it in our journal. This is this pronunciation because of this place name or this story. That's amazing. Your, your attention to detail and authenticity has... Please hold on. The it, bus is departing. It really has become kind of legendary here, hasn't it? Yeah. And you know what's funny? So Puakea is storied. Uh, Puakea Nogomar, he's the voice on board the bus. He's famous for so many other things. He's a, a, a doctor. He's a, a poet. He's a songwriter. Um, but he tells me in his very deep voice, I think when I die, the thing they're going to put on my tombstone is he was the voice of the bus. Kamehameha and Kalania na Ole, Transfer Point. After we did this interview on the bus, we got off at a bus stop. And while we're standing there at the bus stop, I noticed something on the side of the bus, the electric bus. John tells us about how they came up with a name for these new generation of electric buses. And we were talking about local food, and I picked up this piece of our conversation, taping it, talking about the amazing local pineapples that are not exported anywhere else, but are eaten just there on the island. I'm telling you, it's probably the best thing I've ever eaten. So John, I noticed on the side of their bus, on the top of it, the electric bus, there's, some, there's a, lang a Hawaiian language statement. What is it and what does it mean? The statement on the top is, Ua Kauila. So that literally means the power has been turned on. We translated it loosely as power up Honolulu. Like this is our new generation. And you know, here in Honolulu, we always do things different. Here in Hawaii, we always do things a little bit differently. And while most agencies would plaster the side of their bus with green imagery and say 100% battery electric, yeah. we decided to just be a little bit more subtle and a little bit more storytelling about it. And, and that, didn't you say it had something to do with lightning too? Yeah, so the word for uila, the word uila in Hawaiian, it first of all means lightning, but it also means electricity. So the Hawaiians had the, 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 the foresight and the knowledge to kind of see how those elements are related, that electricity is lightning and lightning is electricity. And so... One way you could read that on the bus is what? Power up, power's on, ready to go, new generation. That is awesome. Hiki means from foreign or from away. So we're basically calling it this foreign hollow plant. And that's what a pineapple is. That's what a pineapple <laughs> is. That's the word we had for it. It was like a foreign version of something that it looked like here. Yeah. And so, but my understanding is that the type of pineapple that we get when we eat here we can't get it in the States? Do some of them you don't export or something? Yeah, I mean, there's some that, that are just grown here and they're very specialized. And in fact, some of them are, are you know, refined in, in, their, in their approach that they get sweeter and sweeter. You know, like we have different varieties of apples, yes. different varieties of peaches and grapes. So same with pineapples. Yeah, I mean, the pineapple I had this morning, John, it is, it, I told my wife, the flavor profile is richer and more full than what we get in the States. Amazing. Creamier, sweeter, all the good words. And then I talked to John about what it's like to live on an island in the middle of the Pacific, like Hawaii is, Oahu. And he uh, shared with me some of the famous people and famous ideas that have come from there, and also discussed the larger Polynesian culture and native knowledge. So, you know, one of the things that, that always amazes me about, you know, like, like I said, we have over a million people on this island, right? But we are a very small place, and we are the most isolated place in the world, right? In these islands, which is in the middle of the ocean. And, Every time I ride a plane, I always think about that. Like, how do they... I mean, I know it's computers, right? Yeah. But yeah, they, they get us here, right? And it, right. But, it's like a needle in a haystack. It has been a miss, but <laughs> I can see how, like, if you live on the continent, the idea of that you're just going to head out over the ocean with no other place to land, it, it's kind of frightening, but I guess we don't think twice about yeah. it, right? Everything we do is, like, a five-hour jump from here, but being a very small place, though, we give birth to some very big ideas. 
and some very big people come out of this very small place like Bruno Mars for example um, his mom used to work at a bar two blocks from here wow her name was Bernadette Bernie um, just the nicest lady I actually got to sing a song with her one time it was, uh, yeah. it was Endless Love uh, yeah I love that song <laughs> she, I mean it, you, you find these kind of people our president Barack Obama he grew up with, it, with his grandparents they grew up about four blocks from here wow and it's just to me it's, it's not only that not only that this island gives birth to just big people and big big thinkers but it becomes a crossroad of a lot of smart people crossing through here and you know I'm always real proud of that don't don't like overlook us just because we're from a small place and you were telling me earlier that um, there's like a big triangle and that Hawaii is connected with other places yeah so the, it's called all the people within this this triangle they're Polynesians so the Polynesian triangle spans the whole Pacific I mean farther than the average person would really think Hawaii is the tip of that the northern tip of that triangle but the other two points really far away and you wouldn't even think geographically they have anything to do with each other but what westerners know as new zealand is um the maori people from there are directly related to to hawaiian people um the maori people and hawaiian people are related new zealand is actually the native name for that place is aotearoa and that means the long white cloud in hawaiian language it would be aotearoa and so the languages are so intertwined that um it just speaks to how skilled um, Polynesians were as navigators. The other end of that, so you have Hawaii being the, the northern tip, you have um, New Zealand or Aotearoa being um, all the way out to west. The eastern tip of that is someplace you wouldn't even expect. It's right off the coast of Chile, Easter Island, which is actually, native name is Rapa Nui. Hawaiian would be Lapa Nui. So all of these people are related, and if you look at the things that make these places famous, they're all linked together. Like you look at the Moai, those big statues in, in Rapa Nui, they resemble the statues we have here, the very tiki that, I mean, a lot of the, the Western world has commercialized and, you know, made it into like, you know, bars and stuff like that. But those are cultural things, just like Native Americans have totems and, and those, that kind of symbology is common through all of Polynesia. And even this idea of voyaging by canoe, there were such skilled navigators and navigated by the stars. And um, there are, very much the same canoe landings in New Zealand as there are here in Hawaii. And it just, it's a testament to, and, and now science has proven it out by a worldwide voyage that our Hawaiian navigators knew how to circumnavigate the whole globe. And it's just, it's a really exciting time to just recognize the, the power and the ability of native knowledge. What an amazing time I had in Hawaii. This was my fourth visit there and uh, just really got to know the culture, the island a little bit better this time, and the amazing public transportation services there, along with some great dedicated public servants who are running them and putting them together. Hope you enjoyed this very unique episode of Transit Unplugged News and Views interview with John Nucci, the Deputy Director of the Honolulu Department of Transportation Services. He serves there with my good friend, Roger Morton, who is the director, and other folks who are doing their best to continue to improve the mobility of the people of the islands and all the visitors. Hi, I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. We get a chance in Paul's interview to listen to the beautiful Hawaiian language and to learn about how the Department of Transportation Services in Honolulu has doubled down on its commitment to the native language, culture, and identity of Hawaii. How can marketing help efforts like this, that both communicate more broadly, but also go the extra mile to demonstrate real respect for local traditions? Many of us translate our marketing materials, and if we don't have translators who can help us, Google Translate is an all right solution for now, and its capabilities do improve. Translation helps us reach people who don't speak English, as well as those who just aren't fully comfortable with it yet, and that's important. But changing a word from one language to another doesn't always capture the fullest meaning of the communication. If you have the opportunity to include native speakers of other languages as you're developing your marketing materials, that's all the better. Native speakers working alongside your communications team won't just help you translate words from English. They can give you insights into better phrasings that could help you really get your points across clearly. 
Moving beyond translation, if you're lucky enough to have local indigenous people in your community, as is the case on Oahu, how can you show your support for their ancestral heritage and understanding of the environment? They may be able to tell you and your customers things about the land your vehicles roll through, providing history or new perspectives. In turn, you can showcase your organization's commitment to protecting the environment and providing access to economic opportunity. You'll likely gain more riders along the way. If you'd like to talk more about communicating beyond translation or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Thanks for sticking with us today on the podcast. We're now moving into our leadership development portion of Transit Unplugged, and I'm so excited to have with us today, Keith Griffin, commonly known as Flip. Flip, thanks so much for being with us today on the podcast. Thanks, man. I'm happy to be here, Paul. Really excited. Yeah. Um, Flip has come to me through our mutual friend, Dale Walls. Uh, Flip and Dale work together for the Lion's Guide, which is a leader de- leadership development program for business and government where um, Flip is a co-founder and leadership development director. and uh, But Flip, I'm really interested in your background as a retired Navy Command Master Chief. Yeah. I've mentioned that title to a couple guys who are retired from the military. And they're like, holy moly, you're, you got yeah. a Navy Command Master Chief on? So yeah. tell me a little bit about that and your background there. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, just uh, the, the real story, grew up in Buffalo, New York, all time, 18 years, you know, and then uh, decided college wasn't for me. And so I joined the Navy and 24 years later, they decided to promote me to all the way to the top. And so it, it's an interesting thing. I was a tech guy and special operations kind of search and rescue guy for for most of my for almost all of my career, really. And at the end, when I couldn't fly in a helicopter, I had to fly a desk at some point. So uh, <laughs> I could have chosen to stay kind of medical route, but I, I chose to go the command route. And so I, I was lucky enough and humbled enough to be selected and privileged enough to lead. And um, it was great. I had a, I had one tour at it, but uh, my wife and I had a surprise little nine month package after I got off a long deployment. And so we, we reset the clock. So we have a seven year gap. And so we just decided it was probably time. So I got to do a great, great tour with a great group of, of sailors uh, at squadron in Maryland, actually. And then, uh, you know, just have been I've been out here kind of what I say, getting my executive MBA without actually doing it. So I've been, you know, uh, going around from kind of company to company, really helping kind of in the BD and LD world. And then uh, two two lonely souls found each other in the night with Dale and I. And he was a high performance guy. I was in the leadership development guy. And we kind of just came together. And it's been uh, it's been awesome. We love what we do and we love helping people. And, and that's really what it's all about. That's great. Give me one more thing, though, about for people who don't know, what is a Navy Command Master Chief? So in the Navy, you'll have, what you will have is you'll have a, most people would call them like a, a commanding officer, which is just like a CEO. We have an executive officer who is usually, they'll be training to be the next command commanding officer. And then you'll have someone there for three years that really helps that transition. And that's the command senior enlisted person. And so it's the highest rank you can get to in the United States Navy about 0.05% of the entire Navy. So it's about 500 of us of about 330,000. And so at every command, you have this person that really is, it's a senior executive advisor that's able to, look, behind closed doors, it, it's me telling them that's the dumbest thing. Don't go out the door and say <laughs> that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and we help them to be able to kind of to, to lead, right? It's, it's a leadership position. We help department heads and mid-level people you know, they can come to us at all points in time. And then we have our own, we have 23 programs that we run ourselves of program management levels that we have, you know, chief messes, you know, some some commands like a carrier, that's a command master chief of, of you know, 3000 people. So we can get, it can get pretty high up there. And, and uh, it's just, it's just, it's a privilege to be there. I was humbled to be able to get to that point. And uh, it's a lot of fun. That was the part. It was hard. I mean, don't get yeah, me wrong. Right. It, was, it was fun. Like most things that are worth doing, right? Yeah. They're hard, but fun. Right. So actually that's a, you know, as you and I've talked about, that's a perfect background for what I was hoping you could speak to today because Flip, so many of the people who listen to our podcast are what I would call mid-level managers in public sure. transportation agencies, in government planning groups, and they want to move up in their career. And you've been in that position where you've been as high as you can get in the, in the enlisted ranks. Uh, and advising the top chiefs and also helping lead the men and women underneath your command. So 
Do you have a few suggestions for those uh, who have come to me and said, you know, Paul, I, this podcast has helped me in my career, and now we want it to even give them leadership development tips? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, there's so many out there. And, and one of the things, Paul, and I, and I know your listeners probably know this as well, you know, you could have in, in transportation anyway, right? There may be one set of rules, how you go about, right? Whether it's building a tunnel or putting a train back on the tracks or, or right, a bus routes and, and everything that happens within it, right? And there's one set of rules you write and you do that specifically for that. Well, with leadership, there's a thousand ways to lead and the dynamics of leadership change literally all the time, right? 2020 was a huge change for everybody about how do we lead, whether it's through telework or like, there's just been so much dynamics and there's books, there's millions of books. But my first, my first really tip for the viewers, and especially the mid-level thing is education. And I'm going to say it not like, oh, here's somebody telling me to go get a new degree or whatever. That's, that's not my point. I know there's certs out there. I know that there's, you know, people are, are want to see that on a resume, but the truth is, is that the three things I think about the most is upskilling your leadership development. So listen to a podcast like this, taking a leadership course for yourself, learning about it from a new perspective on it, I think is, is totally, because what people do, and, and, I, and I mention this all the time, you get stuck in a swim lane, right? So if, if you're a rail guy, maybe you're a rail guy only and you don't hear too much. But what I found when I went to the Naval War College is I, we had all these different kind of duties that were in the Navy and we all came together in all of our warfares and what we found out was the sub guys had 40 year old machines that they had to work on and they had problems with the enlisted because right too many for too long is what we were working with. And I was like, that's the exact same problem we have in the aviation world. We have old machines that we're trying to get more out of than we can. And so what what I'm when I say education, I mean, go find out from someone else in a, in a different swim lane because what you're going to find out how they fix their leadership problems. Maybe something that you can take on yourself yeah, and go, oh, applicable. we didn't we didn't even think about that, right? Because th they may not connect on the surface, but definitely underneath to that. And so that that's kind of number one. And, and with that education piece also is have a mentor. Find someone that you know, and it doesn't need to be within your within your kind of uh, your your smokestack. It could be without, but go find someone that you could just talk to and go, this came up. And what that means, that, that could be a group, like we have the Forge that, at, at Lions Guide, but it could be anything. Go find someone that you could talk to and just vent to. That's not going to, not a judging thing, but man, that is, such, that is an education in itself for, for me as, as, as one. And, and we do it all the time with, with everybody else. And I think that's so, so to me, that's number one. Number two, and you wanted me to specifically talk to mid-levels, and I love mid-levels actually more than anything else, because I think they have the most sets of eyes. And so I'm going to tell you to control your eyes, right? So you have CEOs that have a world to themselves, right? They, they're, they're answering to people that, that a mid-level or, or a, you know, a lower level brand new hire would never, they would never talk. So a lot of times you're disconnected, that CEO is disconnected. Well, that mid-level person, to me, they need to understand, and I say this, control your eyes. They need to see the sky and understand a little bit what the CEO is talking about and where the vision of the company is going. They need to be looking at the horizon to be able to know their department and their where they are and what they're going to be and how they're going to contribute to that vision. And then they need to be looking at the ground knowing, hey, how does this now affect my people? So all the way to the top, to the lowest person that, that you're privileged to lead, you need to have a plan for all of them in accordance what, with what your, your CEO's vision is and everything else. And I think so controlling that eyes for the mid-level person and being that translator kind of the relatability factor, I think is so important for a mid-level person to learn how to do. That's good. We were also talking earlier in the green room um, about a principle that you and I agree on, uh, as well as those you've mentioned, which is that a lot of times when people move up in their career, they move up because of their technical skills. Right. So if you're good at turning a wrench, you become in charge of the wrench turners. Yep. Uh, but once you get that promotion, a lot of times you really haven't had the training and how to lead people. Talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I think... You've managed, and I think that's there's a difference, and and everybody at Lions Guide believes this, and I think wholeheartedly you have to. There's a difference between leading and managing, right? There's right. like I can use a Gantt chart, and we can do this, and you can, and and that it's important to to know how to do both, right? But one of the things, so I have my own course called Everyday Leadership. What it really focuses on is that it focuses on. So I'll use CFOs and CTOs for example, right? When they rise through the chain. They're really focused on the technical things and, and the financial things, their numbers and data. 
And then when they get to the top, what, what they've had less of, or they've relied on other people for it sometimes, is, is now the people side of it all. Yes. How do you lead that group now that you're in charge of all the people who are collecting data or all those parts? And so what I do in everyday leadership is I, break, I have a breakdown into three parts. I do a core beliefs. So you really have to go, where'd you come up from? What do you really believe in? How does that align with your CEO and your company's vision? And you need to establish that for yourself. The second one is working on your core abilities. So I take a play on the word ability and we talk about accountability, dependability, weatherability, observability. And those are the ones that you have to actively work on that you've never had to really done, right? So I like weatherability because it's kind of, and it's kind of one of the ones and sustainability, they go together. But COVID happened. Like, how do you weather that storm and now what do you do with it, right? Now, now how are you different than you were before, right? Do your servers are now become drivers and you're still now like the lot, some restaurants did that and they were able to, so that's the survivability and then the weatherability and what's it going to be afterwards. The last section for me is core applications. And those are five that I learned as a command master chief over time that hardened me. And I, I want to call out one specific. If you're ever in one of my classes, you're going to see a can of spam and I keep it on my desk. <laughs> And people are like, Flip, why do you have a can of spam? And, and it stands for something that I think is super important and it's often overlooked and never talked about. And that's, that's the ability to control sex, power, alcohol, and money. Because those, if you ever looked at people and their downfalls of whatever, whatever they have as their rise, I can attest it to either one of those four things every single time, right? So either they were doing something and caught with their pants down when they shouldn't, they had a power trip where they didn't understand how much power they wielded and they were either overinflated or didn't work decisive enough. Obviously, alcohol, we know that's gotten people in trouble, you know, numerous times. And then money problems, right? Either you have too many, you, you break a rule. And so we talk about that directly. And I think for, for, for mid-level people, I'm an, I'm an active spam controller, meaning you're going to know right up front, here's where I am. And, and you have, because it creeps. It's total creep. It, it creeps in on you. You don't even see it coming. And, and, and it, it can be difficult for, for your viewers. And so I think what if those three things, and like we talked about, you, who talks about that rising up through the ranks? You, you don't, right? And so I think you got to look at those things. And, and the three things I think we talked about today, I think are, are, that really is what helps, I think, in everything. And is that what you talk about some on your podcast? Yeah. So on the flip side of leadership, good segue, by the way, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah. So the flip this side- This is my first rodeo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Me neither. Um, so the flip side of leadership podcast, we'll have that starting up again. We're, we're kind of a little hiatus as we're, we're kind of redesigning lion's guide a little bit for some things, but yeah. So we talk about real wrong, you know, leadership stuff and, and it's, you know, we have a couple segments. I have a, a award-winning book author, Laura Colbert, who comes on with me and we do what's called the rant and we just kind of go off on a topic and, and where it's there. And then Dale and I actually host the lion's den where we get in there and we don't know what's coming. We'll each bring our own kind of Hey, did you hear about this one? And what do you think? And and we just want to be real and raw, right? I don't what what I don't like is canned kind of. I don't. I know that the psychological stuff is worth it, and the personality tests are all out there, and I get it. In the everyday world, like you're working on real stuff, like real things come at you, and you're not going to go to a, you know, well he's an RTSJ, and he so he's got to be. I got needs that doesn't happen like that in the real world, and so. I just, we, that's what we'd like to talk about on the flip side is just the real stuff. Well, thanks for being real with us today and, and yeah. giving us some guidance for, I think, especially mid-level managers in our industry as they move up. These are unprecedented times, like you talked about, and we need to be real and, uh, and also adaptive to the current environment. So thank you for sharing some of your wisdom with us uh, and your background uh, that came from your background as a Navy Command Master Chief in the U.S. Navy. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's a great, great pleasure to be here, and I love, uh, love the show. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Trends and Unplugged News and Views with our special guests, John Nucci and Keith Flip Griffin. Next week on Trends and Unplugged In-Depth, our guest will be Noah Berger, head of Merrimack Valley Transit in Massachusetts. Don't forget to visit trendsandunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter so you're always in the loop with what's ever going on with the show. But if you want to email us, you can do that. If you have a question, comment, or want to be a guest on the show, email us at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy. We 
hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind the scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? Then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube, where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com.